So anyway, I assume you'll be soon to be able to retake the exam. But once that happens, you can take it as many times as you want. Use any resources you want. Well, other than copying off each other. Um, yeah, that's basically it. But I think that's will take the first grade. And your last grade, the average. But I'll send an email out that so you guys are all ready for announcement. All right, uh, let's see, Brian Curry Darby. Fisher Hamilton. Hellman. Ashley Senior. Crystal's here. Jayla's here. Norris, Rollins, Saunders, Shamblin. Let's get you two next up at Terry Tennant's time because it's right next to each other on the line. Oh, right. Yes, you can. Uh, Taylor Pierce and Vargas and John. Don't be up lap today. Make sure you read pants and post toe shoes. I guess that's about it. Is the next exam date going to stay the same? No, that's all really, really tentative. Okay. You know, the, the, the dates themselves are tentative, but if you look at the chapters that are going to be on there, that's not tentative, right? So you can gauge, like, we're going to take the exam by what chapter we're basically. And hopefully we'll have it ironed out where it can actually be opened up online. We don't have to be able to do it again, but we'll see. That is mostly out of my hands. And then the other question I have is looking at the Silvara and online, the last lab, are we having a lab report or not? They seem different. Because once I think says we're done after the last two, you have a makeup, that's it. Yep, the lab, lab report would be on uh, not this lab that we're doing this week, but the lab that we start next week. So you can okay. have a lab report that's going to be on the photosynthesis respiration lab. And then the last lab where we meet, um, it's just you get to choose what lab you want to read to. So it, you know, get the score you wanted on the certain grade or on a certain lab, and you need to read that one, submit that as that week's grade. So one, you get to fix that grade, two, that'll be your the next week's grade. Too. So if you wanted to, if you just didn't want to fix anything, say, all right, well, I'm going to choose this lab as this week's lab. And then, you know, so it already has a percent. So it's, it's your choice. It should be really helpful at the end if you know about where your grade is and what kind of class you need. All right, so we've got Darby online and Young online. A little bit more than a minute ago, and I think you guys came in online when I was reminding everybody that you have labs today, so make sure you come with close to a shoot and all that. Um, I know some people have medical excuse, in which case we can just talk about that later individually and figure, figure something out. Speaking of medical stuff again, I apologize for Monday. Be sick. And then, as I was getting over my sickness on yesterday, my sister or my daughter got sick. So I was just like, well, I'll see. After a few days, I'm not sure you can notice. I apologize. 
So, Brian is here. Curry is not here yet. Darby is online. Fisher is not here yet. Hamilton is here. Elman is not here yet. Ashley, Crystal, and Taylor are here. Norris is here. In WBS, you're here? Yep. Both out of WBS, you here, right? Um, Rollins is not here. Saunders is not here. Shamblin is here. Caleb Pierce is not here. Vargas is not here. And Young is online. Did I miss anybody? Fisher is online. And then it's eight. Go slowly. Well, go slowly to see if anybody else shows up. Also, if it's again, I'm sorry, we'll have. She carries it. And it was eight oh one. So yeah, let's officially get started. We are jumping into the next chapter in, in the old textbook. This chapter that we're doing now used to be two chapters. So just like the last one, it's going to be a long one for that reason. And I'm honestly going to go through the first portion of this chapter very quickly. The cell structure and function. When I'm telling you all the different parts of the cells, um, if I do test you on that, it's going to be great. I love it. What we're going to do after this chapter is talk about some very important cell functions like photosynthesis, and respiration, and cellular reproduction. And when we talk about those things, we're going to be talking about the different parts, the really important parts of the cell. I mean, obviously, they're really important. All of them are the ones that survive, as far as academically is concerned. We're going to be really focused on some of them for you to understand some of these processes that happen later. So, for that reason, I am going to go through these parts quickly because honestly, I don't think they're that important to you. Um, again, of that, probably not going to test too much on them. Um, what else to tell you? Is it any questions? All right, so again, in a sense, this is like a new, a whole new lecture. This is my old, my old course. I just didn't skip right over this part to teach it because I don't think you need to know it. But again, I'm trying to teach out of the textbook, so here we go. Let's talk about cells, structure, and function. Here's your learning objectives for this chapter. First, we're going to talk about how cells are studied. That's also very unimportant, but we're going to go through it. Um, we're going to talk about comparing prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. We're going to talk about eukaryotic cells. Finally, the cell membrane, passive transport, and active transport. And as far as the information moving forward, like the stuff you're going to need to know for later chapters, I would say 3.3 down, probably the more important stuff. All right, so 3.1, how cells are studied. So learning objectives of this, describe the roles of cells and organisms. It's kind of important, but again, we're going to be talking about that almost throughout the semester. We're going to compare and contrast light microscopy and electron microscopy, and then we're going to summarize the cell theory. So here we go. Let's jump into it. Microscopes. There's three different types that your book talks about. There's a light microscope, dissecting microscope, and an electron microscope. We will not be talking, or I'm not going to be testing you on any of this. So look it up if you want. We used to have a lab in which we used one. Actually, you know what? We'll put that out there. You guys can think about this. Like she asked, the last lab right now was scheduled to be a makeup lab. So, the last week of class, when you have a lab, you're going to come in and you're going to do an old lab. But if you want, between now and then, let me know. We also have an old microscope lab that some people do. So, if you want, we've got the microscopes back there. Anybody who wants to do a microscope lab instead of an old lab, let me know. I'll make it happen. I always skip it because unless you have a lot of practice in microscope, a lot of times you're looking at stuff. It's just blurry. It doesn't make sense to you. A lot of times people break stuff because I have to teach you the difference between a big knob and a small knob. And people crank it down too hard, and it's usually a, a mess. So that's why I skip it. But if you want to do it, let me know. Anyway, any questions on three different types of microscopes? 
if you want, obviously, I'm not telling you much about it, right? So if you want for independent work, you can look into the different types of kind of uh, explain how they're different and the different uses of that. Cell theory. Talk about this a little bit. Unified cell theory states that all living things are composed of one or more cells, and the cell is the basic unit of life, and that all new cells arrive from existing cells. So if anything, from this portion of the exam, this portion of the chapter that I would test you on, maybe that. That's an important theory, unified cell theory. And of course, you already knew a lot of that because when we talked about the properties of life, that's kind of what we started with. All living things are composed of one or more cells. I've already talked to you that. The cell is the basic unit of life. I've already talked to you that. So the only new information here is that all new cells arrive from existing cells. This is a great independent work topic if you want to look into it. If that's the case, where did the first cell come from? Actually, in your book, if I remember correctly, kind of scratched the surface of that thought, but it really need to to get into it. There was a guy named Leeuwenhoek who was the first to observe bacteria and protozoa, which are really small single celled animal, excuse me, single cell life. You don't need to know that. They're all in between. I'm not going to imagine you about that. But again, it's an interesting story if you want to look into it for the bit of work. But if you, if you forget that, you can still understand all the stuff I'm going to teach you later in the semester. So I think it's not important. Then there was Robert Hook. He's the guy who turned, coined the term cell. So if you looked at him under a microscope, they looked like little gel cells to him. Again, I can ask you about that. You can look, at, look into it for a bit work. I think I've got some videos I can share with you, if I haven't already, which talk about these people. And it's obviously a little bit more entertaining than me just talking about it. Uh, with a slide and that's the intro pictures. Um, and your book also points out that both of them are credited to be the first two scientists to discover microorganisms. So there you go. There is a really good uh, video I've already shared with you, but I'll make sure I share it again. It's on that list. It's really good about um, cells, like when we first, basically this, when we first started discovering cells and learning about them, and when people had different hypotheses about where life came from. I don't know. We didn't know that it used to come from cell. I think it's a really interesting uh, hypothesis people used to have. Anyway, any questions about cell theory? All right, let's jump into this part. Comparing prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. Learning objectives of this are to name the examples of prokaryotic and eukaryotic organisms. I'll stick, that one's relatively important. Um, compare, contrast, Prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells, again, relatively important, um, and describe the relative sizes of different kinds of cells, which I've almost done not going to ask you to do. So, before we even get into it, does anybody know what all cells have in common? So, whether and I probably don't even know the difference between prokaryotic and eukaryotic yet, but what are some things do you think that all cells have, regardless of their you know, prokaryotic or eukaryotic? Any guesses? No guesses. They're afraid to be wrong. You just really have no idea. Here we go. Plasma membrane is one of them. All cells have a plasma membrane. What is a plasma membrane? That is the outer covering that separates the interior from its surrounding. It's the border, if you will. Without that, you just have a bunch of stuff floating around. What's inside the plasma membrane? It's another thing that all cells have, which is the cytoplasm. Almost not. Definitely not going to ask you about the cytoplasm. We're going to talk about it, but if any questions are going to be asked, it would be that you need to know all cells have plasma membranes. But yeah, they have a cytoplasm, which is a jelly like region where all the other cellular components are found. The context of how I would use that word this semester, when you hear me say cytoplasm, that's just me saying the inside of the cell, basically. Or it's all in the context of what we're talking about. For example, when we talk about transcription, where the DNA is read, we make RNA from that. That all happens inside the nucleus. And then other parts happen outside the nucleus. So when I say outside the nucleus, I might say outside the nucleus, or I might say in the cytoplasm, right? So that's how that's what that word means when I use it. Talk about in the cell. Another thing that all cells have is DNA. We already mentioned that when we talked about nucleic acids, right? All cells have DNA. Yeah, I guess you should know that. 
of course, I'm going to have a whole chapter on DNA. So I probably won't ask you anything about it. Um, same with ribosomes. All cells have ribosomes. Those are the things that build protein. And remember, when we talked about protein. It said over half of the cells dry away on this protein. Since proteins are very important, without proteins, we wouldn't have life. So, obviously, the things that make them are very important. But again, these two things are going to have their own chapters DNA will have its own chapter, ribosomes, some other things will have their own chapter. <laughs> so, for that reason, I'm not going to focus on them too much right now. So, anyway, any questions about this slide? All right, so again, this is maybe something you should know. You know, what, what do all cells have? Because again, what we're looking at is all cells. We're not looking at prokaryotic cells or eukaryotic cells. These are the things that all cells have in common. Garth, so your cells, bacteria cells, plant cells, fungal cells, they all have these things. So we all have this in common. That being said, now we can look at the other types, right? Let's, let's look at the differences. Prokaryotic cells. When you hear of prokaryotic cells, you should basically, or prokaryote, you should think bacteria. Yes, technically, archaea, it's a different domain too. We're going to talk about that later in the semester too. As far as we're concerned, at the 100 level, non-major biology course, these two things are almost the same. Single cell. Now, if you want for independent work, you can look up the differences. And again, I think your textbook scratched the surface, but I didn't want to dig into it because of the grand scheme of this course, the differences are not that important. Life also has three domains, which we're going to talk about later in the semester. One is eukaryote, that's us, and the other two are bacteria and archaea. So, are there any questions so far? We're going to talk a little bit more about prokaryotic cells. So far, what you need to know of, you think of prokaryotic cells, you should think of these two domains bacteria and archaea. And again, I'm not going to ask you the differences between those two, but you can look at it. You can look into it if you want. Speaking of independent work, there's also one person here that we have about points issues. So I want to let you know I haven't forgotten about that. I just haven't been able to do it. I have to go through all of our old emails and look at all the all the things you sent me and recalculate it. So I'll do it. I just wanted to let you know I haven't forgotten. All right, prokaryotic cells, they're simple. They're all single cell, unicellular organisms. They don't have a nucleus or any other membrane bound organelle. So later in the semester, when we talk about transcription and translation, you know, when we talk about how to build proteins, uh, or later in the semester, when we talk about photosynthesis, or later in the semester, when we talk about respiration, we'll not be talking about these types of cells because all those things that we talk about happen inside membrane bound organelles. So, and again, just to remind you, all cells have a plasma membrane, right? I told you that a few minutes ago. Um, and now I'm telling you that some of these organelles also have a plasma membrane, right? But not in prokaryotic cells. Prokaryotic cells are too simple for that. And in this case, their DNA in prokaryotic cells is in a center, a central part of the cell. It's a darkened region called the nucleoid. I can ask you that information. All the DNA we're going to be talking about is going to be later in the semester. It's going to be all about eukaryotes, which is us. So as far as I'm concerned, this is not important thing to be done. And maybe I'm trying to think about how this would be important in your life. The closest thing I can think of is if you had some sort of bacterial infection and you're doing research on that particular bacteria or the antibiotic that you're taking for it, and then you read things about other parts of the, of the bacterial cell. That's the only thing I can think of is you could use this. In your everyday life. Anyway, any questions about this slide? Okay, and I'm certainly not going to actually memorize this. I'm not going to give you a picture of, uh, of a bacteria cell so and to name all the parts. Um, let's see. I guess since we can talk about it, the first word for attendance cell. So. The first word for attendance. So, as usual, you guys can send them uh, five minutes after class. To get extra credit. If you're online, you can send those words um, to get your credit. All right. No other questions? Just keep talking about these. And let's talk about eukaryotic cells. I'm trying to do this quickly because, again, my book, this is not very important for later. And also, 
uh, in my books, probably the more boring stuff. I'm not sure a natural biologist is interested in. But anyway, eukaryotic cells do have organelles, obviously, right? So if I just said pro prokaryotic cells do not have membrane bound organelles, organelles, the opposite is true of eukaryotic cells. They do have organelles, including membrane bound organelles. Uh, they have different functions. We're going to talk about them. Again, the really important ones we're going to talk about a lot. So not just in this chapter, we're going to talk about it in later chapters. So this chapter, we're going to go through the, uh, the less important ones quicker. And here's some sizes for you. If you want to go, you know, if you want to compare sizes, like up in Adam, what's the first thing we talked about? Then we started talking about macromolecules, like lipids and proteins. Um, and now we're going to start talking about things like, well, we're going to talk about bacteria. We'll talk about plant cells later. Mitochondria, we're going to talk about a lot later, but there's a general idea of the um, size difference. Again, that's just for your own information. I'm not going to ask you that. If anything, here's all you need to know. Prokaryotes are smaller than eukaryotes. Or the opposite. Eukaryotes are larger than prokaryotes. Which should make sense, right? Because again, the prokaryotes are the more simple organisms. They're single cell. They don't have all these organelles. So they're, they're just smaller. They don't need to be that big. Matter of fact, they couldn't be that big. And if I remember correctly, your textbook talks about why they can't be that big because of the different functions. Not that you need to know that. That's why I'm leaving it out. But yes. Anyway, any questions about this slide? All right, we're making good time. We've got to make that for, for one day. Let's talk a little bit more about eukaryotic cells. The learning objectives are to be able to describe the structure of plant and animal cells. That'll be slightly important. Um, I'm going to take a little bit more time on that. I might ask you questions about that more so than some of the other stuff we talked about. Mostly, it would be one of those things where you need to compare and contrast the difference between the two. Um, you need to state, be able to state the role of the plasma membrane. We'll talk a lot about that in the whole chapter. Um, you'll need to be able to summarize the functions of major cell organ organelles. Again, I'm going to go next to that because I'm not going to ask you that stuff on the exam. I'm going to talk about it briefly because I teach out of the textbook. Again, all the really important functions are going to have their own chapters. Um, and I guess same with this too. Uh, technically, one of the learning objectives is to describe the cytoskeleton and extracellular matrix. And I will briefly talk about it, but I will not be asking you any questions about that. So, are there any questions about the learning objectives? Okay, here's a picture from your uh, from your book. It's a great study tool, right? You can just read this picture, and that pretty much summarizes everything you need to know. And then so, because again, I'm not, probably not going to be testing on most of this. But if you just read this um, in its little short summary, that's perfect. Like, granted, I'm going to talk a little bit longer about it when we go through each of these individual, but I'll love this short little summary. Because that's all you really need to know is the short summary of these things. I know it's probably hard for you to read here, but you know, when you're reading your textbook online, it's going to be easier to see. So, any questions about that before we jump into it? All right. First thing we talked about so far when we talked about cells was the fact that every cell has a plasma membrane. So, let's talk about it. The plasma membrane is made of a phospholipid bilayer that has proteins embedded into it. What is a phospholipid bilayer? It has two fatty acid chains, a glycerol backbone, and a phosphate group. I'm not going to ask you that. I probably won't even ask you the fact that it's made up of a phospholipid bilayer. I'd say more importantly, you just need to know when I say phospholipid bilayer, that's what I mean. Sometimes I use these terms interchangeably. Fossil lipid bilayer or plasma membrane. And in later chapters, I will be talking about this because some of the functions of the stuff we talked about do involve this. And again, at that point, we'll talk more about it. But for now, now you know what I mean when I say fossil lipid bilayer. So, oh yeah, and then finally, obviously, an important function of the thing that makes up the cell, and the really important function as far as what we're about to talk about, is it regulates what comes in and out, right? So we also know from chapter one. That one of the things, one of the um, properties of life is that we regulate, right? Cells regulate, life regulates, it regulates its temperature, its pH, um, the concentration of different things. If you can't do that, you can't control what comes in and out of a cell. So, for that reason, this is important. But again, for the exam, less important. So, same by remember what we talked about after we talked about the plasma membrane. When we said, all right, all cells have this the plasma membrane, what else did I say they have? See if anyone can remember. 
Cytoplasm. Perfect. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit more about the cytoplasm. And again, as far as I'm concerned, all you need to know is what when I use the word cytoplasm, I mean in the cell. But really quickly, let's talk about what the book says. It, can, it has the contents between the membrane, or excuse me, it is the contents between the membrane and the nuclear envelope. So if I were to draw it, what I mean by that is there's the plasma membrane, there's the nucleus. Nice drawing, right? So put it in so you know. And then there's the cytoplasm, right? So again, the cytoplasm is just the inside of the cell, not to include the inside of the nucleus, because it's that its own story, and we'll talk about it later. It's made up of a bunch of different organelles and it's suspended in the gel-like cytosol. What is cytosol? It's a cytoskeleton and various chemicals. I'm not gonna ask you that. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, I probably won't ever use that word either. So again, in my opinion, it's not very important that you know it. Cytoplasm is usually 70 to 80 percent water. Um, I'm gonna put it next to that too. Normally I would ask you that, but I gave you conflicting numbers on the last exam because it was a slightly different conversation. Here we're talking about strictly the cytoplasm. Earlier we were just talking about cells in general. There is a slight difference, but I don't uh, you know. Yeah, let's just say you need to know the cytoplasm is by and large water. And of course, many metabolic reactions take place here. And that is an important bullet point, not because I'm going to ask you about it, but that's a good segue into a lot of the stuff we're talking about. So again, uh, photosynthesis, respiration, uh, transcription, translation, all these important things. We're going to have chapters and chapters and chapters about. It's all going to be mostly taking place in size of all. What's in the chapters? Excuse me, side of the Any questions about that side? All right, and another very unimportant one, as far as I'm concerned, it's the cytoskeleton. It's a network of protein fibers, it helps maintain the shelf of the cell, it's the shape of the cell. It basically keeps certain organelles in place where they need to be or moves them when they need to be able to move. And for you to say the organisms, it allows those cells to move themselves. So, for example, I don't know if you want to put it, I won't say it, we'll talk about it later. So anyway, again, that's what a cytoplasm or a cytoskeleton is. It's important for the functioning of life. Obviously, your cells will be alive without them. Um, but as far as the exam is concerned, as far as the whole higher semester is concerned. This is not very important because we don't really bring it up there. I guess it's just something good to keep in the back of your mind for this bullet point right here. Uh, allows things to move, right? So there's gonna be a lot of times when we talk about stuff moving from place to place in the cell. I don't explain how, but there you go. That's basically how. It's utilizing the side of the cell. All right, there's three types. I'm not gonna ask you about any of them. But here you go. You can read all about them in your book. Big X to this. Microfilaments, also known as actin filaments, intermediate filaments, and microtubules. And again, like this indicates, we're going to talk about all three. I'm not going to take questions yet. Here's the first one microfilaments. So this goes basically, we're going to talk about smallest to largest. Uh, microfilaments are the thinnest. They help move cellular components. They maintain the structure of microvilli, which are folded cell membranes. You don't need to know about that yet. But we will later talk about that and when it's important. That's what we'll talk more about it. And they are common in muscle cells responsible for the muscle cell contraction. I'm not going to ask you any of them. Do you have any questions about what a microfilament is? All right, let's move up a step. Intermediate filaments, which kind of makes sense, right? Micro sounds like it would be the smallest. Of course, that would be a micro too. But intermediate at least sounds like it would be in the middle. Um, obviously, like I just said, it's the intermediate diameter. It's basically there for structural function. It maintains the cell shape. It keeps uh, organelles where they need to be. And some of them are made of keratin. We won't even talk about that either. So again, this is all information. You can brain dump and still understand everything I'm going to teach you later in the semester. But are there any questions about intermediate filaments? All right, microtubules. Same story. Technically, it's important for life, but not for this semester. They're the thickest of the ones we're talking about. They're basically hollow tubes. They rapidly dissolve and reform. They also guide organelle movement. So you can see it's like a big, it's teamwork. They all know how to do that. Um, and they move chromosomes. So 
microtubules, we will talk about when we talk about mitosis and meiosis. And at that point, you're going to need to know what a microtubule does. That will be on that test, but it won't be on this test. So on this test, when I'm asking you about cells and cell functions, I will not be asking about microtubules. We talk about mitosis and meiosis, then you're going to need to know microtubules. At least specifically for that, you know, what they do um, in that job. Like I said, they're going to move chromosomes. But you'll need to know that later. Uh, they also move cells with flagella and cilia. And I'm not going to talk about that later. So anyway, yeah, any questions about microtubules? All right. Let's talk quickly about flagella and cilia. I put a big X to this. I'm not going to ask you anything about this. I'm never going to use those terms ever again in the semester, right? So here they are. Basically, the jello are longer and singular, mostly. There's a lot fewer of them. The cilia are shorter, and there's a lot more of them. Either way, they're both used to group cells. Um, but yeah, if you want to look, you can compare and contrast. You can dig deeper if you want for uh, independent work, but there you go. Unimportant in the grand scheme of this semester. So are there any questions about these two? All right, we're making good time. Here we go, the endomembrane system. This one's a little bit more complicated. This is where uh, membranes and organelles work together to modify, package, and transport proteins. So that's the only reason this would even be important, because later this would be a whole chapter where we talk about how proteins are made it's genetically. We're going to focus on the how we go from DNA to RNA to protein. Because like, like I already told you earlier, DNA, a gene, is instructions on how to build protein. Well, that's what we're going to talk about later in a whole chapter on how we use the code of DNA to build proteins. So this is more like physically how it's done. And again, in my opinion, that's a little bit less important. So we're going to talk about it quickly, but I'm not going to test you on this information. Keep it in the back of your mind. That way, again, when we have that whole chapter on how to build proteins, and I don't talk about physically how this moves from one place to the other, and what part does this now you'll know it'll be in the back of your mind. You know how it happens. So anyway, the endomembrane system includes these parts. You don't need to write them down. They're all going to be on there separately. And again, I'm not going to test you on them. We're talking about the nuclear envelope, lysosomes, vesicles, endoplasmic reticulum, two different types, and the Golgi apparatus. It's a lot of parts. And again, in my opinion, you guys, it's not very important. Maybe since it's there, I don't know. Let me think about this. I might have like a whole second, a big chunk of the exam where it's all extra credit and it's this stuff. Because I'm telling you, you don't need to know it, but for some reason you really want to learn it. I'd like to at least uh, reward you for it. Anyway, the first part is the nucleus. The nucleus is very important. And again, later in the semester when we talk about some of these things, then we're really going to talk about the nucleus. At which point are you really going to get familiar with it? So for right now, you can just consider this uh, an introduction. It is the most prominent organelle. I think what your book means by that is if you were to look, uh, look at a cell in the microscope, in the microscope, it's probably the organelle you would see first. Sort of different if it's a plant cell. We'll talk about that later. Either way, it's trivial information. It doesn't help you guys as biology students. Um, what is important for later on is this is where all the cell's DNA is. Well, most of the cell's DNA, the important ones that are important for, for the context of our discussions. There's also some other DNA and other bases we'll talk about that later. But the DNA that we're gonna focus on that's gonna have its own chapter, it's in the nucleus. And like we already said, when we talked about different macromolecules and bio biological molecules, we talked about the clinic acids, I told you, what does DNA do? What is the genetic gene, which is you know what DNA is? It directs the synthesis of ribosomes and proteins. And there's going to be a whole chapter on this. So again, I'm definitely not going to ask you this on this exam. Because I'm going to have a whole chapter. So that will have that one bullet point where it said direct synthesis of ribosomes and proteins. It's going to be a whole chapter. Anyway, any questions about the nucleus? All right. On that note, let's talk about the nuclear envelope. Um, yeah, I'm not going to ask any of this, but again, this is good information to have in the back of your head when I'm explaining this stuff later in the semester, you kind of have an idea of how this happens. 
Um, a nuclear envelope is a double membrane, both of which are phospholipid bilayers. That's not important as far as the exam is concerned, but keep in mind when I told you cells all have a membrane, right? But it's, and yeah, it's a phospholipid bilayer, but there's only one. So a cell itself is only one. The nuclear envelope has two, which is really unimportant as far as the exam is concerned and as far as uh, other stuff I'm going to you. But I did ask you the question where the first cells come from. And I could also ask you the question, or, you know, for independent work, I could ask you where does the first nucleus come from? That's kind of a hint. The fact that it has a double membrane should take you down a rabbit hole if you were to look into it. But for now, it's just a little fact on the screen. So, um, Obviously, the nuclear envelope is going to be the outermost portion of the nucleus. And obviously, it must be important not to understand, just keep in the back of mind later. It has pores that controls the passages of ions, molecules, and RNA. Because later on, again, I'm going to teach you that we use DNA to make RNA, and that's going to happen in the nucleus. And then I'm going to teach you that RNA leaves the, uh, leaves the nucleus for other things to happen to it. I'm not going to say at that time how that happens and how you know. There's pores, right? They can control what comes in and what comes out of the uh, nucleus. So when I mention it and don't talk about it, don't explain how, uh, a few chapters down the road, now you know the pores that control it. So any questions about the nuclear output? Let's have that be the next attendance word. I'm just going to circle it. So if you're online, listening to this with your eyes closed, which there's nothing wrong with that. So when your eyes take a look, that's the word. Anyway, if there's no questions about this slide, let's move forward. Again, we're going to talk a lot about this later. So I'm going to briefly talk about it now. I can ask you any questions about it on this exam. You can learn more about it later and we test it on it later. Chromatin. Chromatin is made up of DNA and protein. So when we talk about chromosomes, basically, chromosomes are made up of chromatin. Chromatin is about half DNA, half protein. I really talk about that later in the semester. Talk about how that's made up. The fact that the DNA wraps around the proteins and things like that, which will be important later, but for now, not necessarily. What are chromosomes? We've already kind of hinted at it when we talked about DNA, because again, I just said chromosomes are made up of chromatin. Chromatin is made up of DNA and proteins. Uh, so what are chromosomes? That's the hereditary material, right? That's your genes. So the things that instruct your cells how to make proteins, the stuff that gets passed along, the stuff that you got from your parents that you'll pass along to your kids, hereditary material. Again, two chapters on that, actually, on that little bullet point. Um, for you, carryouts, I'm not going to ask you this, it's linear, meaning I'm sure you guys have seen these pictures of chromosomes. This is going to look I'll do my best. They look like big X's, right? That's what a chromosome. You probably see that and say, oh, yeah, that's a chromosome. I see that picture a lot. It's not like that for um, prokaryotes. Not so you need to know that. For prokaryotes, this is a big circle. Again, not that you need to know that. Um, and this will be important. This will be brought up later in a different chapter. But every species has a specific number of chromosomes. So it's just another independent word topic if you want to look into it. Like humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes. So how do we do cats have, or dog, or the parents, whatever it is you're interested in? Oak trees. Watermelons, whatever. So again, in a sense, this is an important slide because it's all really important information. But it's in the context of this next exam, this is an important slide. We cover all this later in much more detail. So, any questions about it? All right. Then there's the nucleolus. That's a dark area within the nucleus, and this is where the ribosomes are made. I'm not going to ask you that either. Ribosomes are really important. Talk about them later in the semester, and one of the chapters they're going to be a bigger player. Um, but yeah, I'm not going to be asking you questions about this. But there you go. Like I said earlier, though, remember when we back it up a few slides mentally. Remember I said the nucleus is where the proteins and ribosomes are made. Now we're getting a little bit more specific and saying within the nucleus is a dark area, the nucleolus, and that's where the the ribosomes are made. Any questions about that? Moving right along. The ER is the next thing we're talking about, the endoplasmic reticulum. Um, let me think about this. 
Yeah, well, I'm not going to ask you a question about this either. The important thing that you need to know in the grand scheme of the semester is this is where proteins are made. So, again, we're obviously going to be talking about it later in the semester. Later in the semester, when we talk about making proteins, the focus is going to be on like how do we take this DNA code and turn that into RNA code? How do we take that RNA code and then build proteins with it, right? So, that's where the focus is going to be on. We're not going to talk about physically, is like how does this molecule move to this molecule? Right? We're not going to be talking about that. So you can just know in the back of your mind, it's the ER that does it. ER is where proteins are made. And then also, that's the rough ER, because um, it has ribosomes, so again, that'll be important later. Just for your own knowledge, this is also where lipids are made, the smooth ER. And there's two different types of ERs, and the rough ER and the smooth ER. Rough is where you make proteins, smooth is where you make lipids. Any questions about that? Yeah, I'm going through this on purpose. I'm teaching out of the textbook. But I'm not going to be testing all this stuff. All right. And notice, too, I also want to remind you, we're still talking about this whole endomembrane system. So we're still focused on the nucleus and the things attached to it. That's what we're talking about. Right? We're, we're not talking about the cytoplasm or the plasma membrane or any other organism. Or, you know, right now, we're basically focused on the nucleus and all the things attached to it. Speaking of that, let's talk about something different. The Golgi apparatus, also called the Golgi body, named after the person who discovered it. Put that up for the network if you want. It is a series of platinum membranous sacs. This is the thing that sorts, packages, tags, proteins, and lipids. Long story short, proteins and lipids, when they're made, they just can go out and about do the thing. They have to be tagged. So that the cell knows where to put them, or if they leave the cell, where to put them at that point, right? And it needs to know which, which things leave the cell, which things stay in. So that's what that's all about. So I'm not going to ask you about that, but that's what I mean when I say tag proteins. It's usually attaching some molecule to it, like a carbohydrate, a long polysaccharide. That way, again, your cell can identify this molecule. And say, okay, this molecule needs to go over here. You can almost think of it like. Um, the ER, which we just talked about, was the uh, sort of factory that builds proteins. And then this is like the shipping department. Before it leaves the factory, it goes here and they put the little stickers on. So then the thing that does all the transport knows where to take it. Obviously, for that, uh, with that being said, the receiving side uh, faces the endoplasmic reticulum, right? So that department bring, gets the proteins, makes sense that it's facing the things that makes the proteins. Of course, the releasing side is on the other side, so we can say, "All right, here's all the here's all the proteins, lipids that are ready to go." So again, before we move forward, I want to let you know I'm not going to be asking you questions about this. But again, again, just just so you know, using the analogy I used earlier, if the rough ER, for example, is the pro is the I can't think of this word today. It's like down there, a factory that's building the proteins. This is like the shipping department, it's getting them ready. To ship them where they need to go. Which again would be really important if you guys are biology majors, because later you would learn about all that stuff and where they go and why they go there. But this is the last time we're going to talk about it, so we will move forward. If there are no questions about the bulgy body. All right, next one lysosomes. Those are basically our garbage disposals. Obviously, I should say obviously, um, but the way they work is they use digestive enzymes. So when I say garbage disposals, what I mean is these things are like taking up other molecules and breaking them down. Because um, we're gonna need the different parts, right? We're gonna need the different parts of those large molecules. So for example, when we talked about proteins, remember we said that's a bunch of amino acids put together. Uh, when we talked about carbohydrates, it said it's a bunch of monosaccharides put together. Well, generally our body needs those monosaccharides and those amino acids that need the full protein, the full polysaccharide, right? So lysosomes can help break it down. Um, yeah. The macromodular. So again, all the four things we talked about last chapter, the polysaccharides, the, the nucleic acids, all that stuff. This is what breaks it down, generally speaking. Um, also, it breaks down worn out organelles. So again, your book used the term garbage disposal. I guess you could also think of it as uh, the recycling. Like, oh, that thing is broken down. We don't need that. It's broken now, but we can break it down and use the parts to build something new. Excuse me, build something new with it. Um, 
Also, another thing it does is destroy disease causing organisms, which is what you see in those pictures. There's a bacteria that came in the cell, its testicle surrounds it, um, the lysosome comes in, it uses its digestive enzymes and destroys it. So, anyway, that's what a lysosome does. We will not talk about them again for the rest of the semester. Are there any questions about it? Okay, testicles of vacuoles. Uh, same story here. We might, I might talk about them. I might use the words later this semester. So in that sense, it's important to know what they are, um, but I'm not gonna ask you a question about it. These are membrane bound sacs. They're used for storage and transport. Basically, they're like little bubbles. So remember, the uh, cell membrane is a phospholipid bilayer, the whole thing, right? And then inside the cell, outside the plasma, you actually have little smaller versions of it, where it's like butted in. So again, these are just like little versions of the cell membrane within the cell. So again, storage and transport. Um, not that I'm going to ask you, but vacuoles are larger than vesicles, um, and they can also break down macromolecules. And I don't even think you what he talks about how, other than the, the lysosomes you just talked about. Yeah, so any questions about vet, vesicles or vacuoles? All right, the next one's really, really important. Yet there will be no questions on the first exam about it, because we're going to talk a lot about them later in the semester, but ribosomes. I already mentioned them earlier. These are the things that make proteins. So I know you're like, wait a minute, I thought you said that the rough ER is where proteins are made. And yes, the rough ER is the factory. I got the word that then. The rough ER is the factory. The ribosomes are the machines in that factory that are actually building the protein. Right? So the rough ER is where proteins are built. These are the things in the rough ER or on the rough ER that are actually building proteins. Later on, you're going to learn about their small subunits and large subunits. So technically, every ribosome is two parts put together. Um, and yeah, we're going to discuss them in a later chapter. So for now, store that back in your mind. Ribosomes are the main star when it comes to uh, building proteins. And I'm not going to ask you any questions on this exam because we have a whole chapter discussing these. Speaking of which, the next one. Not going to ask you any questions on this exam either. Wait, what do you think? Nope. Because we have a whole chapter about mitochondria. One chapter devoted to something called cellular respiration, which is how we get our energy. It's all about this thing right here. You might have heard the term, it's the powerhouse of the cell. And I guess that is technically true. Um, and again, I'm going to put it next to this, because even though you do need to know all this, I'm going to teach you this later. This is right now is just an introduction. Yes, it creates ATP. But fortunately for you as students, that won't be a test question. The question is going to be, how does it produce ATP? How much ATP does it produce? Which of the three stages produces the most ATP? Questions like that. But for now, I'll just tell you what creates ATP. ATP is our energy source, as you can learn later. Where it does get a little bit interesting, in my opinion, is that they have their own DNA. So like I kept saying, most of our DNA is in our nucleus. Right? That's our chromosomes, half of which came from your mom, half of which came from your dad. And your mitochondria DNA is a little bit interesting. And we don't talk about it too much. You can look into it for independent work if you want. Your mitochondria, you got it from your mom. So when the sperm meets an egg, the sperm doesn't have its own mitochondria. So all of the mitochondria in your cells came from your mom, which all came from her mom, which all came from her mom. So when you look at these 23andMe websites, you know they use obviously all the DNA, but the mitochondrial DNA is very unique in that way. So we know it's a straight mother lineage. Which to me is really interesting, but um, again, in the grand scheme of understanding everything I'm going to teach you this semester, it's trivial information. Anyway, any questions about that? All right, another unimportant one, relatively, regarding the exam and the rest of the semester. Peroxisomes. These things are also membrane-bound organelles, but they're only a single membrane. Maybe I'm not going to ask you that. What do they do? They break down fatty acids and amino acids. And they also detoxify any poisons. You can read about it. Your book talks a little bit more about it, but there you go. That's what, it, what they say. No any questions about peroxisomes? All right. This is slightly more important. I might ask you some questions about the difference between plant cells and animal cells, maybe. Um, the only reason I would is because later when we talk about photosynthesis, it's going to be important to know the difference between plant cells and animal cells. So anyway, that being said, Plant cells don't have centrioles, they don't have citrosomes, they don't have lysosomes, while animal cells do. Definitely want to ask you that. 
because it's the grand scheme of the semester, that is trivial information. But the part where it is a little bit more relevant is this next bullet point. Plants do not have cell walls. Excuse me, agree. Plants have cell walls, animals do not have cell walls. And that will be, say, important, but at least it's going to be brought up later. So when we talk about cellular division, cellular reproduction, mitosis and mitosis, that's obviously going to be important. You're taking a cell, splitting it in half to break, to make two new cells. Obviously, if one has a cell wall and the other one doesn't, that's going to be a factor. Same with the next one. Oops. Ah, there we go. Um, plants have chloroplasts. And they're going to learn all about those later. While animal cells shouldn't have, no, that needs to be fixed. Have no chloroplasts. Which again will be important later because when we're talking about photosynthesis, only plants can well, between plants, cells, and animal cells, only plant cells can do photosynthesis because chloroplasts is where that happens. Um, plasmodesmata, I don't want you to talk about that. Um, same with the plastics, we won't talk about that. Uh, maybe the large central vacuole. So plant cells have a large central vacuole. It's slightly important. Basically, it's a big, big part in the middle of the cell that holds water. And you know, have you ever seen a, a cell, excuse me, a plant like lose water and get all wilted? That has a lot to do with it. Because it needs that water pressure pushing out on that large central vacuole for it to maintain its uh, shape. But anyway, so again, the most important things is that plant cells have, excuse me, plant cells have cell walls and animal cells don't. Plant cells have chloroplasts and animal cells don't. Those two are definitely important. And maybe plant cells have large central vacuoles and animal cells don't. If that comes up again, actually it will come up again, but when that comes up again, that'll be in this chapter. So later you're going to learn about um, basically, water pressure in plant cells and animal cells. Anyway, we'll talk about it later when we talk about osmosis. Um, that'll be important at that point. But have any questions about this cell, this slide? All right, the next word for attendance. I'll circle it again. There it is. Next word for attendance. So, again, if you're online, open your eyes and look. All right. Let's briefly talk about this cell wall that we've mentioned here, the fact that plants have cell walls um, and animal cells don't. It's external to the plasma membrane. I'm not going to necessarily ask you that, but like I told you already, all cells have a plasma membrane. But just so you know, that plasma membrane is on the inside of the cell wall as opposed to the other way around. The cell wall is not inside the membrane. The membrane is inside the cell wall. What does it do? It protects the cell, obviously. It gives it structural support, it gives it its shape, and as I mentioned earlier in the last chapter, it's mostly made of cellulose, which is why cellulose is the most abundant organic compound on Earth. Whenever you look at a plant, you really can't see it necessarily. You're looking at the cell wall, you're looking at cellulose. Of course, the color green comes from chlorophyll, that's a different chapter, but mostly what you're looking at is cellulose. Um, the book also points out that fungi and some protists also have cell walls, um, but they're not made of cellulose. And I think the book just leads into that. But again, I'd say the biggest thing you know anything about cell walls, not even all this stuff right here, it's just the fact that plant cells have them and atom cells do not. Any questions about that? We can finish plant cells before up today. Next thing we'll talk about. I'm not going to ask you any questions about it on this chapter, on this exam, because we're going to have a whole. Let me rephrase that. I'm not going to ask you anything I'm about to tell you right now from this chapter, because there's going to be another chapter where we really talk about this. Um, and then you need to talk about it. So, again, this is just an introduction. We're going to talk about this in more detail in a later chapter. But chloroplast. This is where photosynthesis happens. That will be a test question. Historically, someone's going to miss it. I always put it on there thinking it's going to be easy. Man. Where I say respiration happens in blank, photosynthesis happens in blank. Your only two options are chloroplast and mitochondria. If someone's going to flip them, it's going to make me sad because I always put it in there thinking, all right, I get that you don't remember all these details. I'm going to teach you a lot of details. But at least remember that. So at least remember that. Photosynthesis happens in chloroplast. The way I always remembered it, I don't know, 
somehow as a kid, photosynthesis um, and chlorophyll always went together for me. Chlorophyll sounds a lot like, whoops, chloroplast, right? So probably over it that way. Yes, technically has a double membrane. Yes, technically that is important, and you'll see why later. Um, but again, we'll discuss it later in chapters. For now, I'll just think chloroplast. That's what photosynthesis happens. Any questions about that? Again, like it's another thing I told you about, centrovacuole. Plants have them, cells don't. That takes up most of the cell for a plant, um, and it regulates water concentration. So again, when you see a plant get all wilted because it doesn't have enough water, that centrovacuole will basically shrink. And when you do get it, give it water, it expands, and that pushes out against the cell wall, and it will cell the plants to take the proper shape. Um, that is perfect. So when we come back, we'll talk about animal cells. And I guess the last word for attendance will be matrix. I'll see you guys all in lab. I'll be in my office trying to catch up for two days to be on sick.